everyone. Welcome to the Free Tech Data Hub. And uh, welcome to our online viewers as well. Uh, my name is Vladimir, I'm part of the, uh, the Free Tech team. Uh, before we begin, I'd like to uh, tell you a bit more about some of the programs and services that we have uh, here available at the, uh, the Free Tech Data Hub. Um, today's Data Hub session is sponsored by uh, Encore 5G. And uh, Encore 5G is a partnership made possible in part by the funding from the uh, Canadian government and the provincial governments of Quebec and Ontario. And in Ontario, Encore 5G is coordinated by uh, Ontario Centre of Excellence. Um, so Community Tech is actually one of the three uh, digital innovation hubs in Ontario that provides open access to state-of-the-art um, 5G infrastructure. This means that we have a 5G test bed downstairs with uh, 5G antennas uh, on the roof. And um, some of the, uh, the SMEs in the area can actually um, test their new technologies on that uh, 5G infrastructure before that technology gets uh, widespread um, adoption. And uh, we'll have some time for networking after the session. And if you're interested in, in hearing more about um, some of the funded and unfunded projects um, that we have available, we have uh, Suten here, who's actually the business uh, development manager at uh, OCE. And we also have uh, Mauro, who's the director of the defense um, technology platforms here at Union Tech. So after the, uh, the session, um, don't be shy and uh, say hi, and they'll be able to tell you a bit more about uh, those funded and unfunded programs. And um, one thing that we're trying to do as well, too, is that um, we're looking to see if there is some interest from you guys um, for us if we're to put in, uh, develop like a, a peer to peer around 5G technologies. So, just a show of hands of how many people would actually be interested in networking with uh, other um, companies in the area that are developing um, 5G applications there. Perfect. Thank you very much, guys. And uh, one more thing that I wanted to mention, uh, one of the uh, programs that we have available um, here at the Data Hub is called the uh, Fumi Tech uh, Data Flow Coaching. And essentially we do, um, we, help, we work with companies in different areas. And uh, it's usually, it's around um, anything data related. So if it's uh, data government, so essentially um, data planning and um, data infrastructure and all of that. Um, data science, so if we're working on machine learning and all of that. We do have some um, experts in the area that are available to uh, spend a couple of hours to work with uh, your companies. Um, deep learning, so anything, I uh, say natural language processing, for example, is an area that we can help out with. And right now, we um, have a couple of uh, both coaches that work with um, HD mapping, so for example, uh, GIS uh, software development, uh, geographics, <coughs> and uh, data capture, and all of that. Yeah. So if you're interested, um, the link is communitech.ca slash data, and you'll be able to find out more about uh, this uh, program. With that said, um, I'm pleased to introduce uh, today's speaker, Mark Thiessen, who's the Chief Operating Officer at ICERA. Mark is also the Chairman and Founder of the European Telecommunication Standard Institute, so ETSI, which is the uh, industry um, specification working group on quantum safe uh, cryptography and specializing in um, Next Generation Security. Um, he's also a former um, senior VP at BlackBerry and holds more than uh, 100 fundamental patents in areas of the wireless communication. Everyone, please welcome Mark. Ah, so welcome. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, quick, quick introduction. I mean, this is who I am. I, uh, our, our tiny little company, Waterloo, has uh, 54, 55, I don't know, uh, 
full-time employees. It's a very small, it's been in existence for four years. And uh, I'm uh, going to give you a bit of an insider's look at this because I've been intimately involved as uh, one of the people who drafted the standards and invented some of the technology for 2G, 3G, and 4G. So uh, I'll uh, continue. So here's what we'll talk about today. Now, I'm going to spend 45 minutes on this max. That's it. And uh, I don't think the brain can absorb more than that uh, if it's new material. <laughs> uh, but I'm going to spend a significant amount of time on this slide here because I, I've got to set the set the context for you because um, if we don't look at the history of both the problems that we're solving, the technology, the innovations of each step, uh, and, and, and the security, the history of the, the security, then once we get to the 5G part, you won't understand it. It's, it's just, that's just how it is. So to start with what we think of today as zero G, um, really started in the 40s, which was basically an internet interconnect system between uh, the uh, <coughs> FM wireless base stations and the PSTN, the public switched uh, uh, telephone network, which was circuit switched in those days. And uh, MTS meant mobile telephony service, and <coughs> MTS was improved mobile telephony service. The only difference was that IMTS allowed the user to uh, to uh, dial calls and would automatically connect on the other end where MTS was operator assisted. You call the operator and they would pass you in uh, uh, physically. Now, MTS and IMTS in cities, they were um, basically used in the US in cities like New York and Chicago and so on. And um, you had 16 frequencies in most of these cities. Uh, there, there are some exceptions, but basically you had groups of eight frequencies and eight, eight other frequencies uh, that I can remember. Um, so in other words, um, you, you can only have 16 concurrent phone calls for basically the entire metropolitan area of some of these places at the same time. Uh, and you didn't have the notion of cellular. So once you fell out of the coverage area of the system, that was it. You, uh, you, your call dropped, and that was the end of it. In 1983, uh, AMPS was turned on as an experiment, actually, in Chicago. And this was a joint project between uh, uh, Bell Laboratories, AT&T, and, um, and Motorola. Motorola made the equipment. And uh, we had similar things in Europe, which is NMT, Nordic Motor Telephone Service, and then TAX, Total Area Cover Systems. <laughs> this was highly innovative. Uh, this was the first cellular system. So the notion of cells was put in. This was 666 channels of uh, <laughs> FM. No security, just like zero G. No security, although it had a, uh, an NESN uh, electronic serial number, so it would identify you, although you could very quickly uh, clone that serial number and impersonate somebody else's phone. But what was, what was novel about this was the, uh, <clears throat> the notion of cellular allows you to have very small coverage base stations and signaling that would allow you to hand over from one base station to another base station. So as users traverse the environment, they were able to uh, stay in contact with some sort of a, uh, a base station most of the time and their calls would continue without a dropping. And uh, you could fit these multiple of these 666 channel tessellations of FM frequencies in large cities. For example, a place like Toronto could hold more than 100 of these things. So instead of having maximum of 16, uh, 16 calls running concurrently, you could have 66,600 calls, which was amazing uh, at the time. Um, oops. There we go. So, so that was the innovation. Now, as far as security goes, there was none. 
uh, it was FM, it was unencrypted. Signaling systems were very simple. They were basically tone signaling, in-band signaling on a, a signaling frequency signaling channel. And uh, not, not too difficult to compromise. You could uh, certainly build up a, uh, a code plug for uh, another radio and impersonate somebody very easily. But at the same time, during the 80s, the uh, Europeans started looking at this and realized that we have to solve the security problem and the roaming problem. Because there was a notion of roaming in 1G cellular, but it was already done on paper. So the counterparty in the, the visited country would uh, send a bill every six months or three months to the home network of the user that was roaming on their system. And if that uh, user was still in existence on their system, then they would pay their bill, the roaming fee. So this is where I got involved, uh, GSM. Uh, this was the first digital cellular system in the world. And uh, it was also the, the first with security. And, and here's how it worked. We, we introduced the SIM card, or which is basically a little HSM, a hardware security module, a mini, mini hardware security module, in which a shared secret would live. And this shared secrets, <coughs> this set of shared secrets, would, would live between what we used to call a home location register, which is a database, in your home network, say Rogers or Telus or whatever here in Canada, and your SIM card. Nobody got that information but each other. Um, we also introduced the notion of an identity, uh, the IMSI, the International Mobile Subscriber Identity. So here's what happened when a user were to go to another country like France or UK or Germany or what have you, you uh, turn your phone on in the visited country, and you send up, uh, once the base station gives you the right to transmit, you send up a, um, your MC to the, uh, to the base station. And the network says the visited network, Orange or BT Sonda or whomever, says, I don't know this. Okay, this looks like a, this looks like a TELUS Canadian user. Uh, I'm going to ask over the SS7 wireline network if this is a good MZ, if this is a good subscriber. So they send the MZ over with a request and they say, they, they, they look it up and they say, yeah, that's a good subscriber. And we give you two things. We give you a, a challenge and a response pair. So they don't give you the shared secret that you, you derive all the cryptographic functions off of. They give you just what the challenge and response pair is supposed to be. So the foreign network, the visited network, challenges you and you send up the response. And if you send up the right response, you gain access to their network. Uh, there we go. And you derive the cryptographic key off the same, the same information and the error interface is encrypted. Signaling systems were not yet encrypted at that point. And your identity, your MZ, is used once, and then you get this temporary mobile su subscriber identity, the TIMZ, and that's used instead of the MZ, and it changes periodically. So that was, that was what 2G brought to the table. The 2.5G came in a little bit later in the 90s, and uh, I was intimately involved in that as well, GPRS and Edge. And that was the, the act of adding a data plane to the, uh, uh, to the system. So 2G, was basically GSM was circuit switch voice, that's it. We had SMS, but SMS was only used by the operator to send you a message that said you have voicemail. We didn't actually at that point let users send, uh, send SMSs to each other until a little bit later. Well, GPRS was actually a, a packet switch network bolted onto the circuit switch network, which made it very hard to manage. S security was about the same. We didn't change the security. But the biggest, the next innovation was 3G. 3G took this problem of uh, two separate, non-scalable, difficult to manage networks, put them together to make it one, one scalable uh, packet switch network. 
So even if you wanted to make a circus, which you call, it, you, you basically talked to this media gateway that uh, converted your packet switch data to whatever on the other end. It could be circuit switch, it could be other packet switch, VoIP, whatever. And that became quite a bit easier to manage. Uh, the other innovation that was added on 3G was uh, wideband CDMA, which proved to be disappointing because wideband CDMA was more appropriate for point-to-point -point communication because the power control was the issue. So, uh, we worked on HSDPA and HSUPA, which is high-speed downlink and uplink packet access, which was actually a separate little high-speed network where we carved out a little, a little high-speed network uh, for, for 3G. And we had reasonable data rates at that point. Uh, when we first turned on 3G, it turned out that the speed was about a third of what 2G was. So it was pretty disappointing. Then we got to 4G. 4G solved a lot of the problems of 3G, which was the uh, web and CDMA. They replaced that with orthogonal frequency division multiplex, so FDM, which you, uh, gave you the ability to have these little subcarriers uh, kind of out in, in the frequency domain. And you could process each, each subcarrier very separately, so a lot simpler mathematically than, than processing a whole, a whole bunch of uh, uh, in the frequency domain. And that proved to be pretty stable. It's pretty fast. It's what's in use today. And we added, of course, 4.5G added uh, the unlicensed stuff, the beam forming, the, the MIMO, full, full <coughs> MIMO. MIMO is multiple input, multiple output. And that, that so security holes were, were slightly patched up between 2G and 4.5G. And by that, what I mean is the security hasn't changed very much, but they started doing things like like encrypting the signaling channels, which originally you didn't do, uh, which on the, on the slow associated control channel was where your, uh, your SMSs used to be sent, which meant that anybody could just listen in on the stuff and save them all. And, uh, yeah. uh, so for an AMG, by the time we got there, it's pretty stable. So the, if, you, if you look at the requirements between 4G and 5G, you, you've got up to 100x and user data rates, and I can tell you it's probably up over a thousand X in some cases using the millimeter wave uh, uh, technology because you can occupy you know, a couple thousand megahertz of spectrum and uh, get a lot of information through uh, 3X spectrum efficiency, uh, double the energy efficiency, uh, 10X lower latency, and by that uh, they mean two, two milliseconds latency, it's pretty fast. And, uh, at least 100x more devices per square kilometer. And of course, super rapid handovers, like you're, you know, the TGV, the things going 400 kilometers an hour sometimes. <clears throat> you know, plus, plus or minus, uh, you know, whether SNCF is on strike, I suppose, but uh, it, it's, it, it's just pretty righteous stuff. And this is enabled by technologies like network slicing, which is enabled by service based architecture treating things as a separate service-specific technology or service-specific parameters and network function virtualization. So you, you compartmentalize these, uh, uh, these different little mini networks. I'll show you this, it's, it's pretty interesting. Massive MIMO and beamforming. So MIMO is multiple input, multiple output, which is the, the, the act of sending <coughs> over different antennas, different symbols at the same time or split over the time domain so that when one antenna is, is, is uh, have good propagation in your direction, the other one doesn't, the coding technique that reassembles this information can reassemble and recorrect the, the errors, and you get uh, a complete stream of, of good forward error corrected information without retransmissions. Uh, Beamforming is the idea of pointing the antenna's pattern directly at the targeted user or away from the interference source. So this is, this is actually getting pretty mature after the past 20 years of, uh, uh, actually it's more than 20 years, Nin 1996 is when MIMO was uh, first brought into the standards bodies by uh, Bell Laboratories. Uh, also millimeter wave transmission. This is 30 to, six, 30 to 100 gigahertz, and uh, uh, it's very, uh, well, it's, it's a wide open space. There's a lot of spectrum up there that's usable. Uh, I had a millimeter wave lab here 11 years ago. I started it, and it was at 60 gigahertz. And 
we were occupying about 2,000 megahertz in our test uh, system. Our, our data rates were so fast, we had, we had to buffer our information at the receiving end before we could write it into in, in, in static RAM, before we could write it into non-volatile memory because the non-volatile memory was just too slow. So, I mean, it, it's fast. So if you can imagine, you know, pulling up to uh, one of these uh, millimeter wave sites for half a second downloading a movie. I mean, that's the kind of data rates we're talking about here. Um, multiple, um, uh, multiple access edge computing uh, refers to, rather than sending the, the information all the way up through the core network, which takes time and goes through uh, and, and may be subject to, to security attacks at, at, at some point. Uh, you've got services right at the right at the edge of these very smart base stations, and uh, hence your two millisecond uh, uh, latency requirement. Uh, control plane and user plane separation. We do that already. We've done that progressively since 2G, all the way up to to, to 5G, but. I think there's more enforcement of 5G for this and more isolation between the, uh, uh, the, the control plane and user plane so that they don't really interfere with each other, don't influence each other as much. So if you look at the, the use cases, um, it, it's kind of what you would expect. Uh, everything from consumer grade uh, uh, use cases all the way out to uh, you know, machine type communications, industrial uses, things of, of that nature. Um, one of the interesting things, uh, of course, self-driving cars, that would be more of your, your low latency type uh, requirements. <clears throat> and um, things like uh, remote surgery. I, now, I, I saw a demo of this about 10 years ago in Geneva at the ITU, and it was over wireline where you can see one screen and you see the picture of the heart uh, and the surgical equipment operating on the heart. And on the other screen, you see the surgeon operating the equipment in another city. Uh, and that requires low latency. To do that wirelessly is the possibility for 5G, which, which could be, could be a, a very uh, interesting use case for emergency surgery in the field. Uh, if somebody needs surgery quickly, they could, get, uh, they could, they could do this over, over a 5G network potentially. And then there's, of course, the other, the other use cases like, like smart cities, uh, smart homes, IoT devices. Now, the, the diagram on the right you can see, you su it suggests three separate little slices. If you, you know, I'll, I'll show you what the slices are in a second. <coughs> but, uh, excuse me, uh, the uh, consumer, basically the broadband slice suggests a consumer-ish type of thing where consumers want fast data, large amounts of data, up and down, but massive machine type communication really that, that refers to small devices, potentially very, very low power, very, very low battery drain. Uh, sometimes the batteries have to last for years, so you can't put big processors in there. And you don't necessarily want a lot of data. You want reliable data, but maybe 32, 64 octets of data at once. You don't need much for a lot of these applications, and you don't need it very frequently. Uh, the other use case that you see is the ultra-reliable low latency part, that's the self-driving car or potentially remote surgery tank. So here's really the idea of network slicing. So each, each of these little slices here, they're, they're virtual, they're almost like their own little core network. Now, I'm going to get into what some of the problems are in 5G here. Uh, one of the problems is that about five years ago, almost exactly five years ago, uh, the vision here was that these slices would be dynamic. That you could bring a slice up, you could free the resources, bring another slice up, uh, what have you. It turns out that the proponents of this finally decided that they probably won't get their work done in time, or at all, and decided, okay, we're going to lower everybody's expectations here and make some predefined slices with certain characteristics. And some of the characteristics are what you see here. The mobile broadband slice would lend itself to, say, consumer uh, communication, entertainment, internet, what have you, fast, big, big data. 
the machine to machine slice would be more uh, more targeted and parameterized for retail shipping, uh, manufacturing, uh, sensor reading, uh, sensor actuators, some pipelines, and these types of things. Uh, things that don't happen very often uh, or with a lot of data. Uh, the reliable low latency slice, so we talked about that, that could be used certainly for the self-driving car set, the medical, the uh, other infrastructure control that requires fast response. And there could be certainly other slices in there. Uh, now, you can, you can look as well at, uh, you can view these, these slices. I mean, the, the objective is that they won't interfere with each other, they won't steal each other's resources, or if, if they're if it's set up correctly. Um, you can look at it a little bit like this. Although these enterprises, enterprise one through N, actually lives within the core network. But the, the whole point here is that never before has there been this much stuff hanging off the core network of a public land mobile network ever. Which really suggests that this thing hasn't been, been thought out quite completely yet with regard to security, and we'll get into that. Uh, you can imagine uh, someone being able to, to uh, sneak through the, the core network to one of these slices, get into a private, a private network environment and launch attacks. And, and, and these are things that the experts are looking at, and 3 gp and NCA and ITU and so forth. Now, the objectives of wireless security are, are really about the same as they've always been uh, since 2G, except that we've refined our approach uh, quite a bit since 2G. Uh, so there's authentication. That's very important. So authenticating the, the, the user, which we talked about how that happens when they visit the network. Uh, the entity authentication, going the other way. Confidentiality through encryption and non-repudiation through the signatures. Non-repudiation is the idea that that you, you can't say, well, you can't send something and later say, well, I didn't send it because your certificate's on there, so you, you did send it. Uh, so here's the here are the requirements that uh, the properties of the 5G network, and it's it's really a service-based architecture again, enabled by network slicing as well, which. Uh, Cross-layer security, so multiple layers that have uh, multiple layers of security. And it's not, all, it's not all public key. There's some symmetric key as well on the air interface. Uh, <clears throat> software virtualization. Uh, now, redundancy mechanisms are, have taken a quantum leap in, in, uh, in 5G. This is the idea of uh, uh, self-healing, for example. Let's say that some, you know, some terrorist uh, blows up a, a part of a core network installation. Or, or steals, <laughs> steals a base station, or what have you. Well, the network, the 5G network, will have the smarts to recognize what's missing, and it'll start to either immediately or, or very quickly route around where the problem area is, depending on how much redundancy was built into the, uh, the, the network itself. And the redundancy can, can be built in fairly creatively. Uh, the other thing is QoS enforcement is a part of uh, 5G uh, requirements. And now, starting from 3G, we had QoS. We, we had the description of QoS control in the network, but we didn't enforce it. Uh, the, pretty much what happened was the operators all said, ah, let's just turn it up all the way. Uh, minimum latency, maximum throughput, that's what we want. So they didn't really enforce uh, the, the, the QoS, which made it difficult for, for other users on the on the network uh, uh, on occasion because it, when you when you turn everything up all the way your your, your capacity tends to suffer. Uh, so five G will, will enforce the QoS for 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 certain slices. Now quality of service is basically your latency, your your your, uh, your your data rates, your peak data rates, and so on. Grade of service is different. That that that's like availability. Okay, so that that we don't we don't touch here exactly. Um, another domain is identity management. Uh, 
Now, now this, is, this is interesting. The MZ, this is the first time the MZ will be encrypted, the, the subscriber identity, which uh, is good, and yet it's not good. Uh, it's, good for, it's, it's good in terms of uh, criminals being able to grab your MZ and, and compromise you, but it's also good for the criminals because, because now the police can't chase the criminals through the network using MZ catchers. That's how they do it today. They, they have an MZ catcher that's basically a fake base station that grabs, the, uh, grabs your MZ, turns your encryption off, listens to you, uh, tracks you around. Um, so that's going to be that's a bit difficult. The, uh, the uh, police are going to have to go inside the core network of the, uh, uh, of the public land mobile network operator and chase the, uh, the offenders that way. Ultra high precision geolocation. I think we, we just talked about that. That's, that's going to be a very interesting thing. The, the 10, uh, 10 centimeter resolution, that's it's not, not, not very much. That's pretty good. Uh, robust and flexible authentication framework. Now, this is going to be the very first time that a public man mobile network will ever be authenticated by a user. So up until 4G, the, the, the network would authenticate you as users and say, yeah, you're, 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 a, you're a subscriber, you're valid, and, uh, and so on. But now you have the opportunity to authenticate the network. Is this, is this a real network or is this somebody's uh, fake base station that's going to compromise uh, my identity and, and so on? From the security and privacy domain, uh, again, the signaling and user traffic are encrypted and integrity protected. So that's that's been thought well out. That's been thought out extremely well for 5G, because this has caused some problems in the past. Uh, the same thing with the coding rates. The, the we've had cases where the traffic channel was encoded, it was very robust, and the signaling channel was was not coded enough. And you couldn't, even though you could get the call through, you couldn't keep the call up because the signals and the signaling and messages wouldn't go through. So these two go together. Uh, again, mutual authentication between the UE, the user equipment, they call it, and the network. Uh, denial of service uh, detection and mitigation. So there's, there's some of that if it detects a denial of service attack. Uh, what, can be, what can be done is if you take that whole subsystem offline, and then do the self self healing route around approach that we discussed previously. Um, logical separation of network tenants is what we saw with the uh, uh, again the network slices that actually uh, uh, isolates not not just the the resources but the security of the, the users' information from each other. And then O A and M systems uh, the uh, operations and, and and management and maintenance. Uh, audit and penetration testing requirements for the OAM systems. So this is all new, and quantum safe core network, which is now awaiting NIST uh, selection of algorithms, because NIST in the US is in charge of selecting uh, algorithms that will be quantum safe. And some of the problems that we're gonna have, I'll uh, go through. Now there's hundreds of these problems, if not thousands, but I, I, I try to just give you the, the, a few of the really high-level ones, but I mean, they're, 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 there's a ton of them, because this it's, is an extremely innovative step. So first of all, the, the needs of, of consumers are completely at odds with those of the enterprise users, uh, which is not surprising, because consumers need different things. As you saw, the enterprise users would have a different slice, uh, so-called. But PLMN operators like Rogers, Stillness, Orange, uh, BT, whatever, have not had the experience of managing such things just yet. Uh, the other thing is that the CISOs have largely been not present at SC or 3GP or ITU or any of the other organizations or even GSMA, uh, who's the uh, industry association. Which means that the manufacturers clubs will give you as enterprise uh, people uh, what they think that you need, or what what they, well, yeah, or what they want to give you. Uh, 
this could not be good at some point. Uh, if you're not at the table, uh, especially in a standards body, you're going to get what, what the, the active participants give you. The other serious problem is that the specifications are, are nowhere near completed. Um, we were supposed to be able to turn on commercially 5G in 2020, and yet we're still awaiting the standards, the, the security standards to be written. They're, they're not completely done yet. Um, 2022, 24, NIST expects uh, some resolution. We don't know for sure. Um, no, there are some pre-5G systems out there that are, that are being tested. There's some here in this building. Uh, but it's just the beginning. These are experiments. These are things that are designed to kind of get you there. Uh, another set of problems in the uh, security domain is that the, the current security methods that are specified then by 103.645 is just an example, but there's a ton of specifications on this that just don't scale. And, and they're often too slow. And that's going to be that's going to be a challenge because your, your, your data rates and your latency are going to lend itself to really fast response and your security mechanisms may slow the whole thing down. And you know, I've been in this business over, over 30 plus years and I can tell you, well, what are they going to do to fix that? Shut off security. That's what they, that's typically what they do. Uh, the other thing is processes for IoT devices have low power Meaning that they're not going to they're not going to draw too much uh, current and uh, utilize too much uh, too much battery power because some of these batteries have got to last five or six years, and this may not be acceptable for let's say some of the future security requirements like quantum safe uh, security. E even if you're using um, symmetric key cryptography, the public key infrastructure could set up that all that channel, which should be quantum safe. Otherwise. Uh, the key would be at risk. Uh, another thing is, uh, this is a GSMA issue here, the roots of trust have to be anchored in a secure boot for, for, for devices with these, with the integrated UICC. The, uh, UICC is just, uh, you know, it's the, it's the universal uh, integrated circuit card, which is just another, uh, the latest cool way of saying SIM card, you know. But the, the, the problem with eSIMs is that with what they had identified last time I was there uh, uh, with, with these, these group in, in June was uh, if somebody said the eSIM would be an electronic SIM that would just live on your phone or on your device and you would take it into Rogers or whomever service center and they would shoot a uh, new SIM and with a shared secret and shoot up the, uh, to, to the equivalent of the HLR today. Well, if the, if the service center's device gets uh, updated, device gets compromised, then it could be shooting, it could be shooting, um, you know, botnets into everybody's uh, phones, which could be launched and cause a lot of problems. Uh, and, you know, it, it could give a, uh, more opportunities for them in the middle of attacks. Uh, no. Trusted environments are always an issue. Uh, now, I don't know if you, I remember worked I, about 30 years ago. I, I had uh, my old company. I, I, uh, <clears throat> I did a lot of factory automation stuff. So my, my team and I. And, uh, we, uh, you know, you you're working in a trusted environment, which means once you get in the door, there's no security. So like, there could be armed guards outside, but once you get in, you can do anything you want. And so, how does that relate to 5G? Well. You've got the public land mobile network with consumers hanging off of certain ends, and you've got these trusted environments hanging off other slices, and you have to make sure that you don't have a path for users to get in the door in one of these trusted environments through the 5G network. More opportunities for attackers, in other words. It's, uh, and this is something they're still studying, they're still considering. It's a, it's a very interesting problem and a very very difficult problem. The other thing is, is as we discussed, the network operators want control over the, uh, uh, the 5G services. And they have not had the experience of having this kind of complexity to, to manage. So, so, so in other words, 5G is extremely complex and is 
an unprecedented amount of stuff hanging off the core network and the radio networks uh, too than have ever been ever before. So this uh, this could be a challenge. Uh, now that's all I have here. Is there? Uh, I got to about five minutes, right, for questions, comments, anything uh, from anybody? Yes. Yeah. Do you know what the, the IoT community is saying about the lack of security in the future? They're aware, uh, but they are still pushing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Fine. The IoT community is pushing this technology. You know, so considering there are these security issues, what what they are a point of view? Are, are they fine with less security in other of space? In some cases, yes. In some cases, uh, they, they feel it doesn't matter. But I think in most cases, they, you know, they say, you know, I, I, I like I said, I've been around a long time, and I, everybody will tell you security really, 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 really matters. Oh, but I have some security. It's one euro. <laughs> I'm not going to pay for that. See, so there's always that notion then too. And the security is a necessary evil. And also, like I say, it slows down things. And I, I've seen people in, in the high secure government environments, uh, not in Canada, but in other countries, simply turn off security just because they couldn't get their work done fast enough. This happens, yes. All right, so I'll actually be passing around the catch box. If you have any questions, just raise your hand, and I'll come with you and pass the, the catch box around. Uh, just one quick reminder, uh, just try and raise it up a little so that um, people from uh, the uh, online uh, audience can hear your questions there as well. All right, so I see two more questions. Right. Thank you for that talk. It's, uh, very, I, I was pleased to see it from uh, so much focus on the security perspective. Uh, it gives me hope uh, that things will be more secure in the future. Um, however, uh, are we, were, like, is there a concern, uh, so 5G, my understanding is you have to have lots and lots of base stations everywhere, and that's very costly to deploy, so you're gonna have to be able to presumably fall back to a 4G or 4.5G or something similar to that. Um, I, I just, are there concerns about downgrade attacks uh, that we'll see that we've seen in like 3G and 2G generations, where like it, it doesn't matter that your phone does 3G and it's more secure than 2G because they just bump you down to 2G? Well, yeah, downgrade attacks are always uh, well. This is what they call the SMG principle uh, at SC and that at 3GPP. It was you were supposed to make the current the new spec backwardly compatible to the previous, not two generations before but the previous, but yes, downgrade attacks can occur. Um, you, you raise an interesting question. First, I guess the first part of your question is about the, the, the base station. So, yeah, they can be expensive, but, but I, I can tell you base stations are very cheap these days. Uh, even wide coverage base stations are a fraction of what they cost in the 90s. Uh, and furthermore, the little base stations could be this big for the, the um, the um, 60 gigahertz uh, millimeter wave stuff, and and cheap. You can, I mean, you imagine, you know, you, you have an umbrella cell uh, with 4G coverage, and you you pass by, you pass by a um, uh, one of these little 60 gigahertz uh, millimeter cells, and you've already put your order in to download a movie, which will happen in half a second or a second when you pass one of these cells. I mean. Uh, that's kind of what the, the dream, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so you'd expect that like we'll have good enough coverage, despite it being short range, we'll have good enough coverage that I'll just be able to tell my phone don't connect to anything but 5G. Yeah, you can do that. Uh, well, for certain things, it could be application specific. So it could be just uh, normal usage, uh, you know, voice, uh, messaging, <laughs> what have you, and then uh, you order a bunch of movies, right, or, or videos or whatever. It would be downloaded when you have sufficient uh, bandwidth. Uh, I mean, this, the second thing you were asking uh, the, the, about the security stuff, I think it, it's, it's nothing more than a huge opportunity uh, right now. Because it is late, we can serve to rethink some of this stuff, uh, like they've re rethought the uh, 
and at least of the network uh, function virtualization part about all these slices and, and what have you, because originally, like I said, that was supposed to be dynamic, but then not, not quite that simple. I had a question about this quantum safe term. Um, so I, I read a few days back that Google has developed a 50 qubit quantum computer. And I, I don't know anything about quantum computing as such. So how far are we before we should be really concerned about quantum computers being used to crack, say, TLS or some of these other algorithms that we use every day? Uh, that's a really good question, uh, and this is a domain that I'm really active and actively involved in. Uh, quantum computers are problem class dependent, which I think most people don't, don't understand that. In other words, they, 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 they can solve certain problems really fast, and by really fast, I mean trillions of times faster. And other problems, they're not faster at all. Uh, you can see this uh, at the Institute for, for Quantum Computing here in Waterloo, which is the largest such institute in the world right now. And uh, you can set up certain certain problems, like the traveling salesman problem, as they call it. The, uh, uh, it lends itself really, really well to solve that problem. Unfortunately, it lends itself really well to solve cryptographic problems, like the RSA <laughs> integer factorization problem. That's, that's simple for a quantum computer. ECC, elliptic curve cryptography, that's, that's the discrete logs problem. That's easy for quantum computer. It's hard to solve certain other problems like the, the, the sorting and searching stuff, uh, going backwards up a, up a tree, which, which is the basis for some of the quantum safe cryptography. So uh, the time frames you're, you're asking about, it could be any time. Uh, now, that being said, ECC and RSA are aging algorithms. Now, there have been people pounding on these things for enough years where they, 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 every now and then they get broken. So there's a lot of interest, uh, particularly by OEMs and governments, to, to, to solve this problem soon. Um, I had a question about the, the trusted environments. Um, is there any government oversight that's kind of limiting which network operators are allowed to, to have these kind of trusted relationships into the core network? Or is that a kind of a highest uh, bidder, uh, you know, uh, opportunity for some enterprises? Not yet. <laughs> it's been discussed in Europe. I tell you that it's been discussed a lot, uh, but it's not. Uh, no, no, not yet. This is all. This is all totally new. Yeah. Um, I was curious about uh, whether there's. My understanding, I, I, I could be very wrong on this, so please correct me, but the, I'm thinking about like end-to-end -end encryption when it comes to uh, calls especially, um, but like more generally anything. But uh, is there current, in like current generation phones or the 5G network, will there be support for end-to-end -end encryption of, of phone calls? Or, uh, or does it have to be on the application layer? No, it has to be on the application layer. I mean, there, there is encryption of the error interface now, but uh, this is A5, uh, A5.3 right now. A5.1 and 2 have been broken, and there's still A5.3 and 4, and I don't know what else they've got, but it's symmetric. But that being said, but I, I tried to allude to this before, is that even if you're using symmetric cryptography, which is fast, right, because that's what you've got to have on the error interface, uh, public keys too slow, but you have to set it up with public keys. The authentic channels, so you, you, you exchange your key that way. And so that's a problem. If somebody compromises that, then they get the key, they can decode your stuff, and, and it could be difficult. Yeah, one more, I think. Sure. Um, so I'm not an encryption expert, but I have a question for you about the uh, quantum safe algorithms. Are they uh, proven to be safe, or is it just that no one has actually found a way to break those in? Uh, polynomial or under polynomial time, and is there a potential that that will happen? Oh, no, they haven't been proven to be safe because no, no cryptographic algorithm has ever been proven to be safe. I mean, it, they eventually become broken by one thing or another, uh, if not poor implementation or side channel attacks. But uh, uh, there have been two, some of the techniques, there's five basic groups of quantum safe algorithms, and I, I'm not going to get into that right now, but uh, they've been in, in 
the evaluation stage, some of them for 20 years, some for 10 years, uh, some of them for 30 years. So they're not new. Um, now, what's being used right now, the energy factorization work, that's based on 100-year-old math, okay? And the ECC is based on, like, what, 70, 70, 80-year-old math. So, I mean, people prove these things out for a long period before they actually adopt. And if you remember what happened, well, maybe not, in the 80s, they developed DENS, you know, the data encryption standard. And this thing was supposed to be unbreakable. And I think if you look in hindsight, it didn't take long to, to break it, so <laughs> there you go. No. You mentioned that uh, 5G will uh, make harder to trap uh, bad guys. Yeah. But uh, I, I'm, I'm not uh, very familiar. But I remember when I used to work at Bradbury like 18 years ago. <laughs> uh, people were saying that you can uh, trap a device by uh, tower triangulation. Is the same thing that you mentioned? Or uh, you still can do 5G tracking device by tower triangulation? Yeah, I don't see why not, but that's that's kind of not how they how they, they do it these days. Uh, um, I mean, they they would put a fake base station out there, and capture your uh, capture your MZ, and then they can and, it, and it's a, it looks like a real base station, so they can they can shut your encryption off, and then give you the give you the Timsies they want, so they know it's you, and they just track you around uh, and, and save all your voice data and, and, and texting and whatever. So. That's, that's how it's done. Now, no, no, that, that being said, there's a very big difference between what they do in France or Germany versus what they do in North America, especially the US. Now, the French police, because it's a smaller country, 65, 66 million people, they do shut their MZ catchers off when they're done using them. In the US, they, they leave them on a lot of times because every county has a separate budget. And so my colleague at AT&T always tells me like, like, oh man, I gotta call this, these, these county uh, uh, sheriff's departments and tell them to turn their MZ catchers off because they're decreasing our capacity. So it's catching everybody, right? And they just leave them on and forget about it. So I mean, there's some advantage to not using MZ catchers as well. So, so I, I think that's it. I think, yeah, I think we're out of time here, but uh, I appreciate the, the, the audience. Mark, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thanks one more for bringing uh, your time and effort in uh, coming here and um, sharing your insights on uh, some of the aspects of um, security that uh, we should be thinking about when we're developing uh, new services on the new 5G infrastructure. So thank you very much for that. We've also put a, a little uh, something together for to show you our, our appreciation. So thank you. Okay. Okay. Thank you. And uh, to the audience there, um, we'd like to thank you again for coming today. Thank you to our online viewers there as well. Um, we've got a bit of time set up so that you guys uh, can network. If you're interested in um, hearing more about uh, the 5G testbed that is available here or about some of the um, funded and unfunded programs that we have available here at the Data Hub, um, as I mentioned earlier, um, Sutan and Moro are right here and they'll actually be able to help answer some of the questions that you have. Thanks again for coming and enjoy the rest of your day. Take care.